Let's start with a question. Did you know that conflicts between countries that drag on for more than a year often end up lasting more than a decade? It may come as a surprise to you, but it is not common to see such long-lasting conflicts. Usually, they last less than a year. But of course, there are times when that doesn't happen. Of course, we all know that there is currently a war going on that is well over a year old. Indeed, I'm talking about a confrontation between Russia and Ukraine, a war that has been going on for nearly two years, and that some analysts indicate could drag on much longer. This is, for example, the opinion of former British General Richard Barons, which we have already mentioned once on Visual Politics. Ukraine cannot win against Russia now, but victory by 2025 is possible. The brunt of the war dragging on further and further is being borne, naturally, by the Ukrainians. It is they who are fighting and who are watching the Russians raise their towns and villages to the ground. However, the conflict is also a headache for Ukraine's partners, who are making enormous efforts to help them. One in particular stands out, the United States of America, Uncle Sam. The Biden administration has shown itself to be the most committed government in supporting Ukraine, both militarily and economically. But of course, the war has been going on for two years now, and in some Washington policy circles, there are already clear signs of fatigue. Some even fear that the Ukrainian war could turn into another endless conflict, a kind of new Afghanistan, costing billions of dollars for little result, or diverting attention from what they see as much more important issues. For example, containing the increasing influence of the Chinese dragon in the the world. Remember that it was not so long ago that the United States escaped another endless conflict with disastrous results. Afghanistan fiasco already leaves US with a $2.26 trillion bill. And then we have the Republicans. Many like Trump are opposed to further aid to Ukraine. And let's not forget that there is an election in 2024. Not surprisingly, if the United States were to cut off the tap, it would be the worst possible news for Kyiv. Basically, it would mean the end of the war. But for now, Washington is still in full swing, and both dollars and weapons continue to flow relentlessly to fuel the resistance against Russia. Be that as it may, this has prompted us at Visual Politics to ask ourselves a few key questions. How much aid has Ukraine actually received from its allies? What have the Ukrainians done with the assistance they have been given? To what extent might support for Ukraine be waning? Well, we're going to look at all of that right now. Uncle Sam to the rescue. In this year and a half of war between Russia and Ukraine, one issue has dominated the day-to-day -day foreign policy of Kyiv's allies. I am, of course, referring to the degree of military and financial support. This issue has practically become the main pillar of Western foreign policy. During this time, European institutions have committed almost 85 billion euros, many of them in the form of loans. But by far the country that has mobilized the most resources in military, economic, and humanitarian aid has been the United States, which has put up some 70 billion dollars in Aid. It is followed by Germany, a country that has stepped up its efforts in recent months with another 21 billion. Even so, the fact they are the countries that have given the most money and resources does not mean that they have made the greatest effort. In terms of GDP, the United States, for example, has barely invested 0.3% of its economy in this war. As a comparison, countries like Lithuania, Estonia, and Norway are already close to 2%, almost 2% in just a year and a half. This is a formidable figure for countries that have no troops deployed on the ground. Specifically, these countries that you see on the screen are the ones that have made the most effort to support Ukraine. But why so much aid? And why have Western countries thrown themselves into helping Ukraine? Well, think about it. If Ukraine's allies had not helped to defend this country, sooner or later, Russia would have prevailed. Most likely, we would have a puppet government of Moscow in Kyiv by now. That, of course, would have set a very terrible precedent for other dictatorships with expansionist ambitions. For example, China would have had practically a free hand. Also, and I'm sorry to say, but for the West, this is an extremely low-cost war. Any conflict on a larger or smaller scale, let alone one in which allied troops would have to be put on the ground would cost much, much more. And yet, in the case for a relatively reasonable cost, not only has Ukraine been brought closer to the West for good, but also much of Russia's offensive capabilities have been dismantled. 
In other words, from a pragmatic point of view, it makes perfect sense to maintain support for Ukraine no matter what. It may seem that the bill is huge, but if we take into account all that the West spends on security and defense, in the end, it is not even that much. For example, what the United States has put on the table is less than one twelfth of what it spends each year on its own armed forces. This is something that Joe Biden is very, very clear about. The fact of the matter is that I believe we'll have the funding necessary to support Ukraine as long as it takes. When Russia invaded, it wasn't just Ukraine being tested. The whole world faced a test for the ages. Europe was being tested. America was being tested. NATO was being tested. All democracies are being tested. And the questions we faced were as simple as they were profound. Would we respond or would we look the other way? Would we be strong? Would we be weak? The United States is pulling out all the stops. But what has this translated into? And how has the military support to Ukraine that is so badly needed on the battlefield materialized? Well, in massive shipments of weapons, ammunition, and new systems for both attack and defense. <laughs> As early as 2020, the United States began to make armed shipments to Ukraine, which, of course, intensified since the beginning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. More than 35,000 grenade launchers, small weapons, tons of ammunition, and anti-tank systems have dominated recurring shipments from the United States to Ukrainian troops. But on top of that, Uncle Sam has also delivered several surface-to-air missile launcher systems, such as the famous HIMARS, with a range of 80 kilometers, 10 kilometers more than the BM-30 Smirch, used by the Russian army. It has also sent hundreds of pieces of artillery equipment, drones such as the Phoenix Ghost, and manned vehicles such as the 20 Mi-17 helicopters, more than 100 radar systems, 31 Abrams tanks, more than 200 Bradley and Strikers armored vehicles, 1,700 Stinger anti-aircraft systems, and the Patriot air defense system. The total list is long very long. Basically, the United States alone has given Ukraine an entire army. It has even directly managed the delivery of 45 Soviet-era T-72B tanks that the United States has repaired with the help of the Czech Republic. <laughs> And as if that were not enough, at the G7 meeting last May in Japan, Biden announced that the United States would also support its partners in training Ukrainian pilots in fighter aircraft, particularly the well-known F-16. Of course, the help Ukraine has received so far is no small thing. That is why many expected a lightning action. Yet, that has not taken place. Why? Well, listen up. Looking for more cards. I'm sure many of you have heard that this conflict has revolutionized the way wars are fought. After all, this is the biggest war we have seen in many decades, and technology is very much present. In this case, drones, unmanned vehicles, and even Elon Musk's internet system, Starlink, are playing a key role. And of course, what can I say about all the super weapons Russia has been selling us for years? However, the truth is that when it comes down to it, the war is looking a lot like the two world wars of the 20th century. There is even a return to the importance of trenches that we saw in World War I over 100 years ago. And then we have artillery, which played a key role in World War II, and this time is practically the most important military equipment. That explains, for example, the the enormous amount of casualties and the widespread destruction of towns, cities, and infrastructure that we are seeing. In spite of everything, Ukraine has received tons of modern weapons. Weapons designed to carry out the 2023 counteroffensive, a campaign that finally started in June and is expected to continue until almost the end of this year. We have recently uploaded a video on visual politic where we told you all the details. For now, progress has been limited, partly because the Ukrainian government has been unwilling to risk more than it should. You see, despite the fact that the Pentagon has asked them to attack a point on the front with all their forces, in Kyiv they were afraid that this would mean losing a lot of equipment and that if the offensive did not succeed, they would not be able to repeat the action. It was a gamble that the Ukrainians preferred not to take. U.S.-Ukraine clash over counteroffensive strategy. Kiev's forces can still break through Russia defenses, but time is running out. Washington officials say. Keep in mind that they were facing a formidable defense built up over months and months, which basically follows this scheme you see on the screen. A mined area, 
anti-tank ditches, followed by dragon's teeth, trenches and artillery. And so the Ukrainian troops have to advance slowly, trying to make their way through the mined areas while being attacked by Russian artillery helicopters, and drones. The number of casualties is high, and the possibility of advancing quickly is practically nil. Be that as it may, the robust Russian defenses explain why. Instead of gambling everything on one card, Ukrainians chose to attack different points of the front in a more selective and limited way until they found a fracture, which is precisely what they found in Robotine. There, they managed to open a gap that was later consolidated with the entry into combat of the powerful 82nd Ukrainian Brigade, which is the one that was equipped, for example, with the British Challenger 2 tank. The problem with not following the roadmap set by the Pentagon is that Ukraine has given up trying to massively overwhelm the Russian armed forces. And do you know what that means? Well, a much more intense consumption of ammunition. Yes, Ukraine is protecting the most important weapons systems that has been delivered to it. But at the same time, it is prolonging the artillery war and constant tug of war. And that ultimately means more time and more resources. Of course, these resources will still have to come from their Western allies. And this is where we encounter a potential problem, a more protracted war and the need to constantly provide the Ukrainian military with new equipment may end up eroding support for the war itself. So the question is, to what extent could fatigue reduce support for Ukraine? Well, right now, we're going to take a look. Danger due to exhaustion. I'm certain many of you have despaired at some point about the war in Ukraine. It's a long conflict which at times seems to be at a standstill and to which there is no clear way out. That this sentiment is widespread in countries like Spain, Italy and France may not be very important, but when it also spreads to your main supporter, things change suddenly you face an existential threat. And guess what? That's what seems to be happening in the United States. Check it out. Most Americans support Ukraine, but the slowly emerging political fatigue is evident. More than half of Americans already think their country has done more than enough in the conflict. And not because they perceive that the conflict is no longer a threat to America's own national security or stability in the world, most still do. The problem is a different one. You see, the reality is that 8 out of 10 Americans are particularly worried that the conflict will end up becoming eternal. That is, Ukraine will end up being the next Afghanistan. And that's what is behind another statistic that Zelensky is most concerned about. About half of Americans, and at times more than 50%, do not want Congress to continue approving more aid packages for Ukraine. This is probably because only 1 in 4 US citizens believe that Ukraine is actually succeeding. To make matters worse, some politicians and media outlets are also taking advantage of news like this to criticize the intervention in Europe. Almost 90 million American adults struggle to make ends meet, census says. And that's not the only reason. In August, after the devastating fire on the island of Maui, Hawaii, the federal government announced checks of $700 to each affected household, drawing harsh criticism that the government was spending more money to help Ukraine than its own citizens. And of course, all this is happening just as Biden needs Congress to approve a new aid package to Ukraine of more than $24 billion. Without external military assistance, Ukrainian resistance would probably collapse within a few weeks. Most likely, the aid packages to Ukraine will continue to be approved. The stakes are high, but despite that being most likely, we also come across news like this. Here are the 70 House Republicans who voted to cut off all U.S. military aid to Ukraine. Rep. Matt Gates offered an amendment to the annual defense bill to cut off all military aid to Ukraine. The most Trumpist sector of the Republican Party does not want to keep this war going. And of course, keep in mind that in 2024, there are elections. Right now, Trump is leading the Republican primaries. And if he is ultimately the candidate and becomes president again, Ukraine would have a serious problem. Not surprisingly, Moscow is perfectly aware of this situation, and that is why they are trying to prolong the war as long as they can, even if it costs them thousands and thousands of casualties. It would not be surprising to see a new Zelensky tour of the United States soon. Be that as it may, having reached this point, it's now your turn. Will Biden risk continuing to give money to Ukraine, knowing that it is an increasingly unpopular policy a year out from the election? Could this result in the end of Biden's presidency? 
and the return of Trump. How do you think Trump would handle the conflict? You can leave me your answers in the comments. And as always, don't forget that here on Visual Politic, we release new videos every week, so subscribe to this channel, hit the little bell so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like the video, go ahead and like it, and I'll see you in the next one. All the best. See you soon.